One night, when I was maybe 10 or 12, I had trouble falling asleep. My bedroom was the entire top floor of our house with my bed and such being on the left side and storage closets and a play area on the right. I was lying in bed when I heard a noise from the other side of the room and saw a rocking horse begin to rock. It was sitting just outside one of the storage closet doors. It proceeded to rock its way halfway across the room and stopped dead under the ceiling light. At this point, I was freaking out and just buried my head under my blankets and never peeked out again until morning. When I woke up, the rocking horse was still in the middle of my room. Furthermore, I got a stern reprimand from my parents for being up out of bed playing with my toys well past my bedtime. Their bedroom was directly below the storage closet slash play area and had heard creaking shuffling across the room. SHH. When I was a teenager, I used to babysit my cousin Alyssa. She was little, maybe almost two, maybe a little older, old enough to say sentences. I'm giving her a bath before bed when she looks out into the hallway and gets a terrified look on her face and starts crying. At this moment, my aunt's Pomeranian starts going nuts as well, barking and growling into the hallway. The atmosphere in the room became uncomfortable, and I started getting scared. I took her downstairs from the third floor in the townhouse to try and calm her down. I asked her what was wrong, and she said something along the lines of, the man with the black eyes was there. When I continued to pry, she looked up at the second floor stairs, her eyes getting big and looks at me, bringing her finger up to her mouth and said, SHH, while shaking her head no. The trickster. I lived in this house with a basement, and every time I walked up the stairs I would get this weird, creepy goosebumps feeling on the back of my neck. It didn't make me uneasy to go down the stairs or to be in the basement. My cracked room was down there I and I spent a lot of time there. After a while, I would have items I was using disappear when I would look away from them. I would search and search and one day I got frustrated and to no one, in particular, I said erg. Can I please have my scissors back? I had just looked under the pile of new mail and when I turned my head, there were my scissors on top of the pile of mail. I talked to my neighbor and she told me that the original owner of the house was a jolly old man who loved to prank people and that he had fallen coming up the stairs one day and died. I think the goosebumps were him trying to tell me to be careful. And every time after that, when something would disappear, I would politely ask for it back and it would appear in a place that I could not have missed it before. Thanks, old man, it was fun. Unwanted Tenants my daughter was four years old when we lived in our last home. I was a single mom at the time, so it was just she and I alone in the home. I always got an uncomfortable feeling in her room, particularly the closet area, but never thought much of it. Until one evening, I had put her to bed and as I was doing chores I walked by her room and heard her whispering. I listened for a bit, thinking she was talking to herself but it was definitely a two-way conversation, with her saying, uh-huh, okay, stuff like that. I walked in and asked her who she was talking to. She smiled uncomfortably and said, no one. I took her out into the hall and she wouldn't say anything but I could tell she was afraid. Finally, we went outside of the house. She said there was a man in her room who didn't want us in the house, and he had told her this and to tell her mom to leave. I moved us out a month later. She has not since ever had an episode like this. Family Reunion One day when my daughter was two we were having a typical terrible twos moment. She was throwing a bit of a tantrum for about five to ten minutes and we couldn't get her under control. At some point, she, rather suddenly, stopped and started staring at the wall. She then started lightly giggling. It was weird. One second she is crying and screaming and the next she is smiling and happy. Then she starts saying funny lady over and over. We asked her who she saw and she pointed to the wall and again said the funny lady. When we asked her to describe who she saw she described my deceased grandmother, I mean exactly described her. She had never met her, and I don't think had ever even seen a picture, not that a two year old could remember a picture. 
I am not much of a believer in the paranormal, but I know for sure that my daughter got a chance to meet my mom and that makes me happy. When I told this story to my parents, they didn't seem as shocked as I was. When I tried to get a response from them, they looked at me and said I guess you don't remember that you met your deceased grandfather when you were three. The same exact thing happened to you 30 years ago. The Guardian. I had been on the phone with my then boyfriend and he said something that made me think he was a chauvinistic, not nice person, and I remember telling him that if he knew anything about me, he knew exactly where I was gonna go. And I hung up the phone and got in my car. I drove to the park. The sun was kind of down below the tree line but it wasn't dark yet, and I pulled into the parking lot. I thought it was weird that there were two cars pulled side by side and talking to each other. When I got out, the guy in the truck just stared at me in a horrible way, you know, when someone just looks at you like they're looking through you as if you don't exist. I thought, well, this is weird, it's late, and no one's ever here. And then I thought whatever, they're leaving. I don't care, I have my own problems. I only took my keys with me because I didn't want a big purse banging around. I headed across the field, which you have to cross through to get to the woods because there's no trail. I was taking my time and calming down, and then I realized it got really quiet. I didn't hear the birds and the squirrels anymore, I just heard something big moving through the woods. I thought to myself maybe it's a dog. And then I heard the voices. The first voice is a male's voice and he said I know I saw her go in this way, she couldn't have gotten that far. Then the second voice comes, and it's quieter, and it says, SHH, she'll hear you. Okay, so there are two men in the woods and they're looking for something obviously. And I kept thinking it must be their dog, they must have lost their dog. And then I thought they wouldn't try to sneak up on it, I stood there frozen because that's the kind of person I am, I could hear them getting closer to me. And I don't know how long I stood there waiting for them to get to me, but I was completely frozen. And then I heard the other voice. It was distorted, like if you heard someone talking through a closed door or talking underwater. You could understand what they were saying but the voice wasn't right. It wasn't in my head because it had a volume and a pitch that changed that my thoughts definitely don't do. I could almost feel where it was coming from, it was behind me and a little above like it was taller than me. It just said, go to the river now. I don't know if I was more scared of the fact that there's some disembodied voice or a person talking to me or there are two men in the woods. I listened to the voice because I didn't really have other options. I took off toward the river. I made a ton of noise because I was just going as fast as I could and the voice came back and said, No, quietly. I got to the river and jumped down the embankment. I squished myself against it, squeezing down into the smallest, tightest ball I could. The voice kept telling me to stay. And I just sat there hoping whoever was in the moods was going to leave and that I wasn't having some kind of breakdown. And I kept hearing them moving through the woods and I could tell they had split off. As I sat there, the voice just kept telling me to stay and quiet, over and over again, like it was trying to comfort me. I could hear what sounded like someone was right above me and if I leaned out, they could see me. But I had to look. I just tilted my head up a tiny bit and I could see the tips of these construction boots hanging over the edge. And I could see hanging next to them, this dirty old rope. Just swinging next to them swinging. I don't think I even thought anything, I was so scared. I just tried to not breathe. It felt like hours, but I know it couldn't have been that long. The voice even was completely silent. There was nothing but me hearing this man breathing. He started to walk away at some point. And the voice kept telling me to wait. So I waited. And finally, the voice said, Go, now to the field. Go now. It was screaming at me so loud. So I ran through the woods and just got out to the field, far, far, from the cars and street. It was getting dark and I could see the parking lot but it was so far away. I'm running and I start hearing footsteps running, and first, 
They're farther away but they're so much faster than I am. Barreling after me. And there was nothing. I fully expected to see at least one of the men there but it was silent. The only thing I could think was that the footsteps must have belonged to the voice. And I hear it again screaming at the top of its lungs that I need to run right now. And the footsteps come back and they're in pace with me, running next to me through the field. I had a thousand crazy thoughts because none of this made any sense. Finally, I get to my car, and I see both the cars were parked in different places with nobody in them. I refuse to look behind me. If there hadn't been a voice, I would probably be a missing person's case. It got me out of there. Purgatory Road During August 2018, my friends and I took a road trip from New York City to Rhode Island. None of us had been to Rhode Island before, so we were excited about the drive, especially because we had rented a Mustang convertible for it. We left a little later than expected it was about 10.30 p.m., and since it was a busy Friday night, we decided to punch our destination into the Waze traffic app to beat the traffic. Eventually, we started losing steam, so my friend in the backseat fell asleep and I just kept driving along quietly, when my friend in the passenger seat told me to exit the freeway to take a side road. At first, driving on the unlit, winding back roads was relaxing, but then the wind picked up and it got increasingly foggy and misty. I wasn't scared, per se, just a little on itch. I thought about pulling over to put the top up but decided against it since there were no cars in sight. Heavy rain was projected for the entire weekend, so I wanted to get the most out the convertible. Scariest Horror Stories for Adults At Jess Dot Wandering So I kept going along as normal, if not a little too fast to get back to the main roads as quickly as possible when something just shifted. I don't know how to explain it other than an unsettling, exposed feeling. I remember pulling my sweater over my legs to cover up. Then my friend up front told me to look at the street sign in the distance. It read, Purgatory. We woke up our friend in the back seat, who sort of scoffed. Seconds later, we went around a bend where a large red cross was installed on the side of the road with nothing else in sight. We just shrugged it off as a creepy coincidence. By then, we were kind of joking about and indulging in the spookiness, but around the next bend, a big truck came hurtling down the one-lane road aimed straight at us. Luckily my impulse was to swerve a little to the side, otherwise, it probably would have resulted in a head-on collision. My friend tried to get his license plate number but he sped off, while my other friend found the quickest route away from this particular road. We didn't really discuss what happened afterward because we were too creeped out, and we haven't talked about it since. While writing this story, I decided to look it up. I spent an hour trying to retrace our route and found the little road it was indeed named Purgatory, and though we didn't notice it at the time, Google Maps revealed that Purgatory Road was situated next to an old graveyard. Curious about this road, I researched it further and discovered that two teen girls had died there in August of 2011 in an accident on their way to visit the grave of Rhode Island's infamous vampire, Mercy Brown, who died in 1892. Apparently, they decided to go for a drive down this dark, windy road because they thought it looked haunted. A watery grave. I didn't grow up believing in ghosts. Then one morning when we were 16, when my friend's mom picked us up for carpool, I mentioned that I was really creeped out by this bathroom under the stairs in my house that no one ever used. I couldn't exactly define why I felt this way, I just found it eerie. The house I grew up in was an old Victorian home built in the 1800s, so eerie vibes were part of the package. Hearing this reminded my friend of her own creepy bathroom association. She told me that when she lived in the German countryside for a year, there was a little section in the home that no one but her middle sister used, who was about nine years old at the time. During this time period, her sister would wake up with bloodshot eyes, sometimes even bruises, and feel totally exhausted. Disturbing Ghost Stories At Beige Renegade They did everything to investigate what was going on, including sleeping in her room, working with a child psychologist, 
and a school counselor. My friend doesn't remember much from this time period, other than her sister being disturbed by something the year they lived there. She mentioned that she and her other sister, the oldest, also hated using that bathroom because they would always feel off and find thick black hair stuck in the drain, even though each of them had fine blonde hair. At this point in the story, my friend's mom abruptly stopped the car and jerked her head around and said, that's where the woman who once lived there killed herself. She drowned herself in that bathtub. Her mom was clearly shaken. She said part of the reason they moved was because something felt off in the house. Mom averts danger. The scariest thing I've had happened while camping. So I live in Eastern Oregon, and my mom lives in Western Oregon. I went to visit her for the summer and she's very outdoors so we decided to take the one hour drive from her city to the coast. We end up at this free campsite at the top of this hill, huge foothills of the coastal mountains, about a 25 minute drive from the top where the campsite is to the bottom where the main road was, and we were the only campers there. We relaxed for the rest of the day, made food, etc. A truck full of men drive up the hill and talk with my mom, I don't know what about, wasn't suspicious at the time, and they leave us. Fast forward to the middle of the night. I wake up to my mom sitting straight up in the tent. I wake easily so I heard her gasp and it woke me. As soon as she saw I was awake she put her hand over my mouth because I was starting to ask her what's wrong. It was dead silent and all of a sudden you hear footsteps right beside the tent. The little flap that covers the zipper was even moving. Thankfully my mom has quick wits and said very loudly, Kenny grabbed the gun. Kenny is my dad, although that doesn't matter, and mind you he was not there, just us girls like I previously said. They left. No harm was done. Thank the Lord for my mama. TL, DR, two girls at a campsite alone, people outside tent in the middle of the night and my mom pulled some badassery. Ouija board knocks back. In high school my friends and I were messing around with a Ouija board one night. We had done it before and nothing remarkable had ever happened. We usually did it to try and scare each other or our girlfriends. We all thought it was a joke. That night there was no one else home except the seven of us and we were all together around the board. One of the girls there wanted to try it. She had never done it before. This time was different. The board misspelled some of the words the same way every time. It gave answers that seemed really historically accurate for our town, things we neither knew or cared about. Long story short, the spirit claimed it was a 10-year-old boy who had died on the property in the 1800s and was buried there too in an unmarked grave. My friend's house was on a farm in the edge of town. We were all a little freaked out because the board had never been so detailed and consistent. However, we were still skeptical and we were all assuming one of us was trying to scare the rest. Finally, my friend asked if the spirit could do something to prove he was there with us. It went to yes and then spelled out K-N-O-C-K. -K. Then the planchette stopped moving. We just all stared at it silently and then there was a rap 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 on the window right next to us. The lights were on outside and there was absolutely no one out there. We never touched that effing board again. Forgotten memory. Growing up, my bedroom was the only one that faced the front of the house slash street. When I was about eight or nine, I woke up to my dad calmly but firmly telling me to get up, go in the bathroom, and shut the door. I was annoyed because I was half asleep, but I listened. Apparently I was more tired than I realized, because I feel asleep on the bathroom floor. The next morning I asked my mom what happened. She seemed oblivious and confused. 
I looked at my dad like she was crazy, and I asked him why he had woken me up. He denied doing it. I was becoming frustrated to the point of tears, but I ultimately let it go. Fast forward to college. I was home one break, and I decided to ask again. I had thought of that night off and on for years, and it still bothered me. This time, my dad goes, huh? I was wondering if you even remembered that. Turns out that a lot of houses on our block were being vandalized and robbed all those years ago. Someone had broken into the garage and was inside the house. My room was partially over the garage. My dad heard it happen and quietly got me to safety. Police were called, the guy ran. He was never caught, however, and my parents didn't want a terrified kid on their hands, so for years they pretended like nothing had ever happened. It wasn't supernatural, but it was unsettling for sure. See also, Halloween movies for scaredy cats. A clockwork orange style break-in. Not to me, but to my sister. Her husband and her had just had their first child a few months prior. My brother-in-law was working the graveyard shift at his job as my sister stayed home taking care of my nephew. Around 2 a.m., she heard loud knocking on her back door. She went to go check it out and saw a lady banging on the door asking for my sister to let her in. The lady told my sister that her husband had just beat her down the street and was looking for her. My sister was hesitant to let her in since she had a newborn in the house and didn't want to interfere. She told the lady that the best she could do was call the police for her. The lady told my sister to not call the police and to let her in. This is where my sister got suspicious. She went to get her phone and called 911. When she went back to the door, the lady was gone. The police arrived a few minutes later and they told my sister that the same situation happened a few streets down. Apparently the couple would do this act to get into people's homes. I'm sure this is very common but having it almost happen to my sister and my nephew just creeps me out. Some real clockwork orange shit. Phantom alarms. When I was in high school, I had a lot of these experiences. At the house my dad lived in at the time, it was really old, built in the early 1800s, there were plenty of times I'd be sitting in the living room and distinctly hear the cabinets opening and closing in the kitchen. It was just me and my dad that lived in the house, and you could clearly see when his bedroom door was shut and he was asleep, but still hear it. Normally my dad worked 7 to 3 but occasionally worked a PM or overnight shift. One night he was working until 11, I was 17 at the time. Around 8 or so, I'm sitting in my room playing Borderlands, and think I hear footsteps coming from the living room, which was adjacent to my bedroom, and assume my dad's home early. Go back to playing Borderlands. I keep hearing the steps so I pause the game and listen and the footsteps are just slowly pacing back and forth between the living room and the kitchen, in a steady rhythm. I laid in bed scared shitless, and actually counted the steps. Every time it took 15 paces to the living room, 15 back to the kitchen. Needless to say I did not fucking sleep that night. Had another situation at my mom's house, about two years prior to this, out of nowhere my alarm clock would go off at midnight every night. I assumed it was busted and got rid of it. Fast forward two years, my mom gets another, brand new alarm clock for my room, also when I was 17. Suddenly, alarm goes off at midnight. I thought nothing of it, turned it off. Happened again the next night, and then my sister pointed out the old one I had that did it. So I checked and made sure no alarms were set, double checked at 11.56. Sure enough, four minutes later my alarm goes off. Freaked out I threw it out. That next night was my dad's night to have me. I had a buddy of mine over and my dad was working that night. He left for work around 2 a.m. And my friend had brought over an iPod dock to listen to music on. Didn't have the clock set or anything. My friend knew nothing of the last couple nights so I knew he wasn't just fucking with me. So about two minutes after my dad leaves, we hear an alarm clock coming from my room, I went in, 
and you know how if you just plug in a clock without setting it, the numbers just blink on and off. Well it was doing that, as soon as I picked it up, the clock set itself to 12 o'clock and then just turned off by itself. So, yeah, fuck paranormal shit. I'm not religious at all but I am 100% convinced that it happens. Mom's scary boyfriend. About five years ago, my mom started dating a guy she met on a dating site. That part is fine, I had recently started dating the woman who would later become my wife and we had met online, I'll just refer to her as my wife for this story. Anyway, my wife and I never really liked this guy. We didn't think he was mean or anything like that, just a little creepy, he was quiet, he kept his eyes closed a lot, and occasionally said odd things like offering my wife a chocolate and then popping one in his mouth, closing his eyes, and moaning as he let it melt in his mouth. One time my wife and I were visiting my mom but she got called into work, so we waited at her house. Her boyfriend was over but he spent the entire several hours just hanging out in her bedroom with the door closed. Just before Christmas, my mom and this guy started having some difficulties. My wife and I were visiting her for the holidays and she dropped all of her problems on us and we listened carefully and told her our opinions and suggested that she would be better off without him. She already had her mind made up, though, and decided to break up with him on Christmas Eve. We spent the night at my mom's and got up early on Christmas morning to visit my dad at his house. We didn't plan to spend the night at my dad's, but we got snowed in, which was actually a nice Christmas surprise. The next day we left as soon as we could get through the snow and my wife suggested that we stop by my mom's house on the way so that we could see if she was okay. My wife just had a really bad feeling about my mom's now ex-boyfriend. My mom's car was in the driveway, but that doesn't mean much because she lives close enough to work that she often walks and it hadn't snowed in her town. She also never locks her door, which drives me crazy, so we let ourselves in. That's when we see blood oozing out of the refrigerator's water dispenser. It had filled up the spill container and was leaking onto the floor and had made a puddle. My wife screamed and I freaked out. I fully expected to see my mom's head in the freezer. I nervously opened the freezer to find a bag of frozen cherries that had been opened crammed into the freezer so that it fell onto the ice dispenser, and melted. TL, DR thought my mom was decapitated by her creepy ex-boyfriend. She heard it through the wall. Four years ago, I lived in a very large farmhouse, that was converted into two apartments. The house was known as the old boys home. It was used to house boys with behavioral issues but was closed due to allegations of molestation. Anyway, I was living with my boyfriend and three-year-old daughter at the time. My bedroom had a large fireplace that had been boarded up and painted over. I decided to push my bed up against it one day while I was rearranging things, it was like a headboard. That night, around 1 a.m. I had heard a small voice saying, Mom, Mom, Mommy. I had sat up in bed but didn't see anything so I reached over my boyfriend trying to grab down to grab my daughter and put her in our bed. I kept feeling around and I was still hearing the voice but I couldn't feel her. My boyfriend woke up and turned the bedside lamp on asking me what the hell are you doing. I explained that Amelia was trying to get in our bed and I was reaching for her. There was nobody there. My daughter was sound asleep in her room. Then the next night came. Around 1 a.m. again my dog had started to whimper at outdoor so my boyfriend got up to take him outside. You know that feeling in a bed when someone lies down next to you. Where the bed pushes in and there is a warmth in your back. I felt that, so I assumed my boyfriend had come back to bed. I rolled over, my boyfriend wasn't in the bed and I felt the fucking bed release pressure. Whatever was laying next to me has gotten up in that second. I moved my bed the next day to the other side of the room and I never had another incident in the two years I remained in that house. You're lucky I'm scared, too. Some random thief was in my house, who I spoke to, who left me a weird message. Was sitting in my room at like 11.30 p.m., heard lots of shit downstairs, assumed it was my mom. Heard her walk up the stairs to my room, 
stop. I called out to her. She didn't say anything and walked downstairs. I went down about a half hour later to find a piece of paper with the words you're lucky I'm scared too on it, and a whole bunch of shit was missing. Called mom, she still hadn't arrived home from a dinner she was at with her friends. I called the cops and locked myself in the bathroom, but I think they left when they realized I was still home, probably the most scared I've ever been when I was hiding in the bathroom. A ghost testing the waters. Their first night after moving into a haunted house. I currently live in a haunted house. I've heard voices, footsteps, lights have been turned on slash off. One of the ghosts has a thing for silverware. I hear it clattering in the drawer all the time. And sometimes a knife or two will end up in the wrong slot in the drawer. But the strangest slash scariest experience I had was the first night I spent in the house. I wasn't finished moving in. There were boxes everywhere. I didn't even have my mattress up there yet. I was betting on an old futon mattress, watching a video on my phone, when I get the pins and needles feeling of my feet falling asleep. Except it wasn't on my feet. It was on the top of my head in the shape of a hand. I said, good night, turned off my light and tried to sleep. When I woke up my closet door was ajar, but other than that everything was otherwise untouched. I guess whoever my unseen roommate is, just wanted to check out who I was on my first night. A reminder from the past. When I was around 16 my rapidly growing family finally moved from the house I had spent my entire life in. As you would expect, we spent a lot of time fondly remembering things we used to do in the house as we were packing everything up. At some point I decided to go into the downstairs closet with a flashlight and read, something I used to do when I was younger to get some peace and quiet. Now, this is one of those deep closets that goes under the stairs, it went back around 8 feet and then had a left turn into a very low maybe 3 foot high space. This space was largely occupied by a mountain of old blankets and stuffed animals. Of course, this is the most fluffy spot to sit and rent. About an hour in I shift a little to get comfortable and I hear a low, slow, warped, hoarse voice say you always make me happy. I flipped my shift, hit my head on the low ceiling, and practically broke the door down getting up. After hyperventilating and explaining to my family why there was no color left on my face I went back to see what it was. It was my stuffed little bear from when I was 3 or 4 years old that I happened to lean on Juyuwa's right to press his belly. When I pressed his stomach again though, nothing. This poor bear I hadn't played with since I was a toddler used the last of its power, used its dying breath to tell me I made it happy. You make me happy too little bear when you're not making me piss myself. A warning. I saw a dead Sodder's ghost in my barracks room before I deployed. It was the guy's room who died on my company's last deployment and I was the first to be issued it. He told me to be safe. He had half a head. I'm agnostic but that makes me question it. I've had two other experiences that I'm not quite convinced about, but my great grandma used to visit me in my dreams after she died for like 15 years. The plane ride that never ends. I've been flying for almost 30 hours and the flight attendants won't stop crying. 30 hours ago I hopped on a late night flight from New York heading to Los Angeles. After boarding I saw that I had an entire row to myself. Take off passed without incident, and soon I was stretched out for a nap across the road. I slept for a few hours, I don't know how long but I woke up to some severe turbulence. It's possible that the lights in the cabin went out for a moment, but I was so disoriented that it's hard to sit. I checked my phone to see that it was 4.03 AM, which I figured gave me about an hour until we landed. When I looked out my window, I was shocked to see nothing but wide open ocean. My jaw dropped, there's obviously no ocean between New York and Los Angeles. I hit the button to call the flight attendant and spent the next few minutes racking my brain for a lake that could have been possibly been big enough to explain what I was seeing. I jumped when the attendant flipped off the light. She was grinning from ear to ear, and tears were pouring down her cheeks. How can I help you sir? She asked. I froze for a moment at her reaction before deciding to just ask my question. 
Where are we? Why does it look like we're flying over an ocean? She wiped her cheeks to clear the tears, still grinning wildly. Sir, we'll be landing in about an hour. I, uh, okay, thank you, I said. After she left I checked the clock on my phone again. 4.03 AM blinked back at me. It hadn't changed. I had to have been waiting with my call light on for at least five minutes. How was it possible that it hadn't changed at all? I opened up my laptop and saw it to display 4.03 AM. I pulled out my phone, started a stopwatch in the app, and spent the next two hours looking back and forth between the clocks, waiting for them to change. They never did. I tapped the shoulder of an older woman sitting in the row ahead of me. She looked back, an annoyed expression across her face. Yes, she asked. Do you know how long until we land? I asked. She narrowed her eyes. That flight attendant said it would be about another hour. I shook my head in confusion. That flight attendant. We talked almost two hours ago. We should have landed already. She stared at me as if I was crazy. I was going to continue trying to convince her, but I felt a hand on my shoulder. I spun to see a male flight attendant grinning down at me, tears pinging off his cheeks onto my shoulder. Sir, I'm going to ask you to calm down, or I'll be calling the captain. I told him that wouldn't be necessary and sat back. He removed his hand and stepped away. The flight attendants continued to stop by every few hours offering meals. My stopwatch continued to tick up and is now telling me that I've been on this plane for more than 30 hours. I've explored all of coach and tried talking to some of the other passengers, but they've all told me that they're expecting to land in an hour or so. Around three hours ago I tried getting into first class. I made it past the curtain but was escorted back by two grinning flight attendants. Their grip on my arms were like iron. Sir, the seat belt sign is on, one said. Please remain in your seat with your buckle fastened. We'll be landing in about an hour. I'd just about given up hope when a woman came down the aisle dressed in a business suit. She didn't look at me or slow down, but she dropped a piece of paper onto my tray as she made her way to the bathrooms at the back of the plane. I shot a look around before unrolling it. It said, are you stuck to? I pulled out a pen and wrote yes. It's been 30 hours. I folded the scrap of paper up and set it on the tray closest to the aisle. She left the bathroom and picked it up as she passed. It's been 20 minutes since then. I don't know why, but I don't think the flight attendants would like it if they knew we were talking. It doesn't matter. I have to do something. I'll update you all with whatever happens next. A home invader tries every house in the cul-de-sac. I told this story of my parents' old house when I was living with them before college. I live in a small cul-de-sac in the middle of nowhere. The next nearest neighborhood is over four miles away. One night a few years ago we got over a foot and a half of snow overnight. So far from main roads and on the weekend I knew our roads will be remain unplowed for quite some time. I went to my outback deck door to look at the snow-draped trees and the still heavily falling flurries and take some pictures when I noticed footprints leading to my door then turning around and leaving. I looked and saw that they came from my neighbor's side and thought that one of their more delinquent kids played a joke as my sliding tube on the railing was popped. I decided I'd wait till later as it was early to call their parents. I went on Facebook and after scrolling for a bit I noticed one of my neighbors closer to the entrance posted did someone knock for me or something at my back door. I immediately called her, talked, and told her I have an idea. I called the first house on the entrance and told him what was going on. He went and checked and sure enough, they were there too. Everyone started calling everyone else. I called the family at the far end and they told me there was none there. Then I got a call from my next door neighbor. She called the woman that lives next to the end house. She said that there were footprints that led to her door. But none led away. We already called the police by this point but now we called them back and said that it's an emergency now. 
They told us the roads are still all unplowed and they can't send a plow truck to clear the way as they are a privately owned company. The woman was losing it so one of the husbands, huge bear of a man, across the road from her texted her to say he was coming over to invite her over. He came and she left. We put up one guy's live feed motion recording hunting cameras facing all exits. Nothing came out. Around 7 p.m. a plow truck came as well as three Colombian pesos cars. The couple she was staying with and her went to her house and stood in the doorway as the police surged. They found nothing. She begged them to keep looking so they did. Two of the cops went into the basement again. This time only one came up. He took her to the side room and we could hear hysterical crying. By now we are all out there. Me and a few of the other guys started towards the door when several police confronted us. They told us they found someone hiding under a cover opening in the stairwell that she didn't even know existed. A few minutes later a scruffy man screaming and kicking came out in cuffs and was led away. In his little camp out they found blankets she just cleaned and put away. In the room next to hers. She stayed in other people's houses for a long time before going back. Even then she wouldn't stay alone. She sold the house the next summer. He turned out to be a thrill-seeking junkie who was on probation for assault against a family member. The cops told us that they feel like he didn't want to stay at his apartment after a fight with his roommate and drove off in his roommate's car from the county over and got stuck in our unplowed roads. And that is why you always make sure you lock your doors. I see everything. I was with my little brother home alone when we suddenly heard a creepy voice from the other room saying panda underscore panda come here. I want to talk to you. We didn't know who or what it was and immediately ran upstairs. While we were running to our room, we heard someone nearby say do you boys think you can run from me? I see everything. At this point we were terrified, locking the door to our room, grabbing our mini baseball bats and crying. We were certain we were going to be killed or eaten by some monster. Then, it happened, a loud bang came from the closet and the monster sprang up. We both screamed, my brother fell, and I threw the bat at, my dad wearing an IT clown mask and laughing hysterically. Turns out he was behind the whole thing. First, he had put all the cordless phones in the house on speaker and said he was leaving to run some errands. Then. He proceeded sneak back into the house, hide in our closet, and scare us. Two sentence horror story. I finally found my wife the kidney she needed. It took forever to track down everyone she'd donated organs to after the crash.